Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Then I pay my special respect to all the fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. I also thank today AMI Brazenda and all our participants from different parts of the world to join our seminar today. <coughs> our AMI president, Christopher Lamb, will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, May Chair, and welcome to everybody, says me, and particular welcomes to our two speakers, Chris Sedoti and uh, Professor Mimi Winbird. Both of them have been described very briefly in the flyer that we sent around advertising the event, but they can say a little bit more about themselves if they want to when we start. We have 35 people so far, we may get more, uh, but we should start now because the subject of sanctions is one that will take a, a lot of time to discuss, I'm sure. There'll be a lot of people who will want to contribute to this discussion. And it's a very lively issue in Australia, in Myanmar, and in the rest of the world. So without further ado, let's start. Chris Sedoti will speak first. His experience is very broad, as you know, and he's a member of the, I get this wrong all the time, Chris, because there's too many SACs con uh, connected to Myanmar. <laughs> and of course, yours are the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> so he is with the Special Administrative, Special Advisory Council, is that right? Myanmar? Yeah, that's correct. The Special Advisory Council for Myanmar um, to put it briefly, Chris, they're SAC and we're sack them. <laughs> oh, that's right, you are. Very good. Right. Okay. Good. Well, with that in mind, and Mimi Winbird is a person whose lineage traces from Burma, but who's an American citizen, used to be in the US Army, and is now in Honolulu, where it's now a little bit after nine o'clock at night yesterday, our time. Yes. And so thank you for being able to be with us at this time. And I hope we're not invading too much of your own private time. So thank you for being here. It gives us an opportunity to hear two very different backgrounds, giving their perspective on sanctions and their utility. So Chris, you're on 15 minutes. And then after that, Mimi will speak for about 12 minutes and then we'll move to questions and answers. So thank you. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Machel, and thank you, Chris. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you and with AMI tonight. You, your monthly seminars are playing an extraordinarily valuable role in the discussion of events in Myanmar. In talking tonight about sanctions, I, I basically want to tell a story. And it's a story to illustrate the first law of Australia's international human rights diplomacy. The first law of Australia's international human rights diplomacy is the further away a human rights crisis is, the stronger, faster and more principled Australia's response will be. The story tonight is just the, the recent, most recent history. It starts in November 2020, when a generally free and fair election was held in Myanmar. I, I say generally free and fair because it wasn't conducted in all parts of Myanmar, in, in some conflict areas. Um, it was decided that the election would be deferred. But there were international observers and the international observers reported that where the election was, was carried out, it had been carried out in a way that was generally free and fair. And members of parliament, it's two houses, were elected by constituencies in most parts of Myanmar, though not quite all. The parliament elected in November 2020 was due to meet for the first time on the 1st of February 2021. And among its first tasks was the election of a new government. Um, all this history is well known to you. Um, you know, of course, that the parliament could not meet because early that day, the military staged a coup, um, commenced a coup, which two years later is still not completed. So the beginning two years ago, 
was an armed uprising on the part of the military. And it was met by peaceful resistance by large numbers of Myanmar people. People who took to the streets in their hundreds of thousands for the better part of two months. Those demonstrations were amongst the largest Myanmar had ever seen. They stopped only because the military became progressively more and more ruthless in shooting live ammunition into the crowds and killing large numbers of people. When the coup commenced, the Australian government leapt into action. It immediately condemned the coup. Um, it suspended a very small military cooperation program worth around about 300,000 Australian dollars. That's 200,000 US dollars, a very small program. And then it did nothing. And it continued to do nothing. The rhetoric continued as the coup continued. One step was taken, or rather one inaction was taken when the term of the Australian resident ambassador at the time of the coup expired uh, some time later, she was not replaced. So Australia currently does not have a resident ambassador in Myanmar. But apart from that inaction, still nothing was done. Meanwhile, others were adding action to their rhetoric we at the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, soon after our formation in March 2021, uh, adopted what we called the three cuts strategy. We urged cutting the arms supply, cutting the money supply, the cash to the military, and cutting the military's impunity. And those three cuts have been the basis of our advocacy in the intervening two years. Our call, but more importantly, by far, the call of the Myanmar people for economic sanctions against the military was picked up by most of Australia's traditional like-minded allies, um, those with whom we are always very eager to collaborate. They began to impose sanctions very quickly. And over the two year period, more and more individuals and entities were sanctioned. Just before the second anniversary of the beginning of the coup on the 1st of February, 2023, Canada, the EU, the UK and the US had sanctioned 181 individuals and 178 entities and more were added on the 1st of February. Canada has sanctioned 89 individuals and 63 entities. The EU, 83 individuals and 11 entities. The UK, 37 individuals and 27 entities. The US, 74 individuals and 32 entities. <coughs> Many individuals and entities are on both lists and so I don't seek to add up the numbers and come to 181 individuals and 178 entities. Um, there is a lot of overlap between these lists. And during that, that same period, um, Australia itself acted resolutely in response to the Ukraine crisis. In the 12 months between the launching of the Russian invasion on the 24th of February, 2022, and the first anniversary on the 24th of February, 2023, Australia imposed sanctions on 1,004 individuals and 221 entities. Demonstrating that first law of Australia's international human rights diplomacy that I mentioned earlier. Australia had previously imposed sanctions on five individuals from Myanmar in 2018, after the Rohingya crisis of 2017. Those five were basically middle ranking military figures. They were not the top military leadership. They did not include the commander in chief, the deputy commander in chief, the chief of staff, the head of army. It was those in the, the next rank. 
and only five were sanctioned. That was the most that we were able to do. And those sanctions came many months after the Rohingya crisis itself, well into 2018, when the crisis began on the 25th of August, 2017. In 2019, the United Nations fact-finding mission on Myanmar, of which I was a member, produced an intensive study of the military's economic interests. And it, rec and it recommended the imposition of economic sanctions on the military's companies and their vast network in the Myanmar economy in an attempt to cut the cash, which later became the second of our three cuts at SACM. The Australian government did not impose any corporate sanctions. In 2021, in spite of the commencement of the coup on the 1st of February and the action of Australia's traditional allies, no action was taken by the Australian government. In 2023, on the second anniversary of the beginning of the coup, Australia finally sanctioned 16 individuals and two entities. The individuals were the 16 members of the Junta's uh, Special Administration Council, and the entities were the two conglomerates, the two major holding companies for the uh, Myanmar military. No sanctions were imposed on any of the subsidiaries or affiliates of those companies, just on the major holding companies themselves. Australia's response, therefore, has, in accordance with the first law, not been strong, not been fast, and not been principled. I've struggled for two years to understand why, why we got to this position. The then Australian government certainly used fine rhetoric and said on many occasions that sanctions were under consideration. The then opposition stated that it supported sanctions. But when the government changed in May 2022, there was no immediate or even soon after change in Australians policy. Um, in spite of the previous pre-election commitment to sanctions, none were imposed until February this year. One of the reasons given for this was Concern for the well-being of Sean Turnell, who was, as you know, in, in prison for almost two years. Um, Sean spoke eloquently in the last AMI webinar a month ago. And um, I'm sure that any, anyone else of you who participated in that webinar could only have been impressed by his strength and his clarity and his vision. It seemed to me, though, that whenever Australia talked about Sean Turnell's release being our absolute priority, he was being used as a shield, as an excuse for Australian inaction. The proof of that to me was in the comparisons drawn at the time. The United States imposed very heavy sanctions very early in the piece. A United States citizen, Danny Fenster, was arrested early in the coup. And in spite of the strong position taken by the United States, he was released in less than six months. The United Kingdom imposed strong economic sanctions right at the beginning. A UK citizen, Vicky Bowman, was arrested in 2022. And in spite of the UK's strong position, she was released in less than three months. Sean Tunnell was released only after almost two years, around 21 months. The comparison is stark. Any, any sense that Australia's inaction in addressing the coup was because of concern for Sean and the commitment to get him out was not borne out by the evidence, the comparisons with the situations of other foreign nationals. Now, I'm not saying or suggesting for a minute that there was any lack of concern for Sean Turnell. Indeed, both the, the former government and the present government and the former minister and the present minister were totally committed to his release. But I'm afraid I have to conclude that he was being used as an excuse in addition to that well-founded concern. 
There was concern as well about Australia not being seen to be doing something different from what ASEAN does. And yet ASEAN states, or many of them at least, have taken strong positions. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore even, have strongly condemned the coup. And the Singapore foreign minister recently announced that there has been uh, arms embargoes against Myanmar for some time. Um, the first time there has been a formal public acknowledgement by an ASEAN government of any form of sanctions against Myanmar. Australia could have got a great deal of support from the, the ASEAN members who were most concerned about the coup if it had wanted it. I can't see that as justification. The imposition of the sanctions, the first sanctions at the beginning of February were a beginning, but much more is needed. We need to extend the economic sanctions to other parts of the military's economic empire. The 2019 fact-finding mission report identified 106 subsidiaries of the two conglomerates and 27 affiliated companies but none of them have been included in the Australian sanctions list. We need to follow the lead of the United Kingdom in sanctioning the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, the, the greatest single source of revenue for the military in Myanmar. We need to sanction the supply of aviation fuel, which is enabling the Myanmar Air Force to continue flying and bombing resistance villages and towns. We need to sanction the defence, the Department of um, Defence Industries, which is providing significant local production of armaments and light arms in Myanmar. Our Special Advisory Council for Myanmar recently completed an extensive research project looking at the international companies that are supplying raw materials or parts or technology that enables local arms productions. They need to be sanctioned. And we need to sanction the banks. Most Myanmar people don't use the banks. They, they use informal money changes. The military uses the banks and they use the banks to enrich themselves. There is a need for positive action as well as the negative action of sanctioning. We should be looking to support economic development and indeed humanitarian assistance in those areas of Myanmar that are controlled by the democratic movement, that is the national unity government, <laughs> the ethnic resistance organizations, and the citizens, uh, the civil democracy movement. Work done by the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar estimates that more than half of the townships in Myanmar are not under military control and are in effective control of the democracy movement. We need to be providing direct support to them in a positive initiative, rather than simply being content with rhetorical condemnation or even more sanctions. And we need to act positively in recognizing and promoting the legitimate government of Myanmar, the national unity government. It's about time that the Australian government, the still new Australian government, challenged that first law of Australia's international human rights diplomacy and started taking more seriously human rights crises close to home. We need to match our rhetoric with action. We made a beginning on the 1st of February, but really, so far as Myanmar is concerned, we've only just begun. It's two years late but it's not yet too late. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Now, Mimi, you, would you like to offer your comment now? Are you ready? Sure, yes, I will. The floor will. is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a story as well. Um, you know, um, in line with what Chris was saying, um, I was invited to attend uh, U.S. Australia um, uh, Indo-Pacific Regional Security uh, Dialogue over the summer. 
and I was there and it was four hours. Uh, well, I, I only stayed for four hours. It was if they were doing it for uh, for the afternoon, uh, but I was there for four hours. Three hours into that discussion of Indo-Pacific, you know, there were a lot of issue being discussed about throughout the region, all the security issues. Um, and then also um, uh, uh, Ukraine was brought up several times, right? Three hours into it, Nima was never mentioned in the Indo-Pacific security issue as, as one of the things that, they, you know, that Nima is the only one that is in open conflict. There's a lot of bombing dropped and, you know, people getting killed, right? Uh, and But it was not a part of their uh, uh, discussion. And it was a U.S. Um, uh, a security you know, officials um, and from Australia security official, as well as some of the lawmakers were there. And they were just very concerned about the Pacific and uh, Pacific Islands. And yes, we should be, but also um, uh, they were concerned about Ukraine, but they weren't really concerned about Burma, Myanmar. So uh, three hours into the discussion, I started, <laughs> I pounded the table and I said, <laughs> We've been going no going on and on and talking about for three hours, and Ukraine, which is out of outside of our region, has been brought up several times. But Burma in your backyard, and Myanmar was never brought up, you know. And so I told them that that's a strategic blind spot for everybody, and that's exactly what China wants it. That we forgot all about Myanmar, right? So that's what I. <laughs> That's just <laughs> so it's not surprising that you know Australia is a little bit slow and uh, uh, in, in its response. And as for the sanction, you know, sanction actually they always say, oh, military doesn't care about the sanction. And I'll tell you that um, you know the engagement starting, you know, U.S. started to engage with the Myanmar military after Secretary Clinton went into Myanmar, right, in 2012. And every time I met with a lot of the higher level general, they always talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, their sanctions and they always complain about the sanction and they always want to know how they can get rid of it. How can they get, they can get out of it, right? If it wasn't really affecting them, they wouldn't, they wouldn't worry about that. So I would argue that the uh, sanction does hurt them. And one, you know, um, symbolically, symbolically, you know, it tells it tells them that, you know, what they're doing is not acceptable. And then earlier, Chris said like a logistic, actual logistics of cutting their logistics, right? With the oil and gas, uh, the financial means and uh, any type of uh, weaponry and, and banking. Uh, and, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, and then the third, the third, the one thing they 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 uh, concern most, and then I'm I'm sure my Myanmar, uh, the Myanmar participant here can tell you, um, a lot of the military members they want their children to be able to go to Australia, U.S., U.K. for school, for school, and their ability not to be able to send the kids to school like that is also hurting. You know, it it really drives them crazy. So it works. It works if you can do it. But um, as for the, uh, 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 you know, strong, you have to send a strong signal. The military, right? The Nima military, they're run by a lot of bullies and they behave like bullies. You know how you deal with bullies? You have to be very strong. You got to punch them in the nose, right? You got to punch them. Otherwise, they don't, they don't respect you and they don't stop. They don't stop. They smell weakness and they will come after you, right? That's what the bullies do, right? So similarly, you have when you're dealing with these bullies, uh, I think you have to be very strong in your response to 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 uh, uh, you know to to send the message as well as that's how they that's the language they 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 understand they understand. So um, uh, and then um, as for the real um, as for the real um, real help, you know, yeah, like uh, Chris, I, I completely agree with what Chris has said. Uh, not only the sanction, but actual real positive action and something like um, the defector support, right? When the early, um, I think early last year, right? Suddenly there was a, a news of that Australia was accepting some of the military defectors to come. It went crazy. It has, it has, it shaken the military. And those actions are also very, very um, uh, uh, 
powerful. And also my work in looking at all the um, re uh, past revolution that are successful, when we look at that, we found three elements. And I, I, I have coined it DIP, D-I-P. First is defection. I is international pressure. And then P is people support. And it, those are the three elements that appear in all the um, you know, successful um, um, uh, revolution of the past. And so defection, being able to help in defection, right? How to support the defection? How do you help them create more defection? Uh, that is the non-lethal way of collapsing the military, right? So if any way can to support uh, or, or like a communication effort, you know, uh, uh, in order for them to get the more defection going. And then once the defection defector come out, how to support them. And I, I've been advocating for like, for those defector, we need to grab them and put them through now DDR process, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, DDR and SSR, right? Get them educated for DDR because we may need them for the DDR process. Right. And instead of them like twiddling their thumb and just just not uh, uh, just sitting around, me starting to give them education on DDR. And that will I think that will go a long way in the, uh, the post-conflict uh, transition. So another thing is uh, that, that the, the Australia or other country can do is some type of a ability to travel support. For all those dissidents that are coming into Thailand or into uh, uh, into uh, India, right? They can't travel because of it. Many of them don't have travel documentation. Some way to help them, and the military uses it to impede their the the, the opposition, the um, resistance uh, maneuverability, right? Because when you can't move, you're you can't operate freely. You really. Uh, shutting down their maneuverability. That's one of the nine principles of war, right? And flexibility. So somehow, some way, if we can figure out a way to help those people, you know, be able to travel or move around uh, uh, relatively easy, you know, and it doesn't have to be immigration into a another, uh, not like a, to live there, but so that they can travel there legally and then work, you know, the issue from that, more a safe zone, you know, safe zone. Uh, so that type of stuff will go a long way. Another one is communication, right? That's one thing that they keep on. And military has been doing everything they could to cut the communication, right? Uh, we always say in the military, shoot, move, uh, shoot, move, and communicate, right? Those are the three elements that's most important. Shoot, move, and communicate, right? So I talked about move, meaning maneuver, right? And then the third is the communication. And, 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 you know, if we can get more reliable communication equipment, as well as the communicating the MIMA issue to the larger, larger um, international community, right? Just like the Ukraine. Ukraine did a great job in telling their story. And the MIMA, you know, uh, resistance has not been able to tell their story. They, and, you know, for, for many reasons, but one of them is a language capability and they just, you know, they, they came from a very um, a top down communistic uh, or socialist type of environment. They don't use the, are, they're not able to utilize the, the media and that type of environment to really tell their story so that the international community will understand it. Thus, that's why when we're sitting down in US Australia um, event, right? Burma was not mentioned at all. And this is where the, you know, actual conflict is people are dying and bombs are flying. And so it's happening, but it was not brought up because they're not able to really communicate. So those are some of the areas in addition to sanction that I think Australia or, you know, people from outside other country can help to move the, the ball uh, to get to the actually uh, tipping point, tipping point. Thank you very much, Mimi. That's very, very helpful. Uh, before we go back to the questions, I have one specifically for you. What does DDR stand for? 
Oh, I'm sorry, DDR. And the other thing you mentioned was, was it yes, SSR or, or something? Yes, SSR, DDR, right. Uh, demobilization, disarmament, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration for the ex combatant, right? right. It's, it's for the, and the SSR is security sector reform because as they more you know, develop, uh, they, they have been talking about federal army in post conflict situation. Yeah. So okay, they thank you. Learn to develop, but they have to rebuild the uh, you know, military to be a military under the civilian control. You know, military under uh, a, in a democracy, democratic system, right? So that's what I was. Yes. Thinking. Okay, uh, I think that some of the questions that have come in, we'll come to them in more detail. But first of all, there's a question for, all the way from Paris, from David Camru. Thank you, David. It's very good to see you here. Uh, you managed to come to us at all times of the day and night in Paris, so that's good. Can you say something more? I think, Chris, was it you who, who mentioned ASEAN and the, the, the place of ASEAN in Australian thinking? Australia says that it's working all the time to strengthen or stand by the ASEAN countries, but there's not a lot of evidence that they've done very much. Do you see any prospect of that being different under Indonesia's chairmanship uh, or that we should be leading walking a different path on this? I, I would say yes and yes, Chris. Uh, certainly, Indonesia's chairing of ASEAN will be different from the last two years with Cambodia and before that Brunei, um, but also different from next year because Lao is the chair of ASEAN next year, and we know that the Laotian government is still close to the Myanmar military. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have an opportunity this year that we have not had to date and we may not have next year. And I think that Indonesia um, has made very clear already um, its wish to take initiatives in relation to Myanmar that can break the deadlock that currently exists. Uh, but ASEAN itself is not united. Uh, it's basically split down the middle, 5-4 um, in in how strong it should be in dealing with Myanmar. And this is where outside partners, and in particular Australia, can play a very important role. Uh, it's, it's clearly important, ASEAN, clearly important, but it's not sufficient. And one of the problems that we've had is that while acknowledging the centrality of ASEAN, and the UN does this all the time, um, while we and the UN and others acknowledge the centrality of ASEAN, we are not assisting ASEAN to break the internal deadlock um, or to establish a, a wider regional strategy. Um, I think that if we are to see a more active role on the part of Australia, it, it needs to be in partnership with Indonesia to try to develop a regional strategy that includes ASEAN but extends beyond ASEAN. So this needs to incorporate as well Australia, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Japan. Um, trying to have a truly regional response that is not subject to the divisions within ASEAN, but can move beyond those. And so I, I think ASEAN is important. I think Indonesia's leadership is important. Um, and I, I think this year presents opportunities, but the Australian government needs to stop sitting on its hands uh, and get out there and do something. The opportunity is there to be seized. Right. When it's come to ASEAN, right, uh, not all, for example, Philippines, yes, other than, you know, a part of the Philippines, a part of being ASEAN, the actual ASEAN member, members that are really close, the border area, right, or like Thailand, really, ASEAN need to kind of pressure or, or nicely, I don't know, whatever they need to do to allow, make Thailand you know, provide that safe zone, right? Because I see, I hear on a daily basis, you know, that people are uh, uh, always, uh, the, the resistance, you know, uh, forces, they got there, they try to do asylum, but they can't get the ex exit visa because Thailand won't do it. Or they won't, you know, they don't get, act they, they want to register, but they're always afraid, 
right? So all that stuff is not, again, it's helping the SAC rather than the, the resistance. And then the Thai, Thai and also ASEAN really need to understand that as long as the military is, you know, there, like the way it is right now, it, it's not good for regional stability. You know, regional stability is at, at stake here as well. So if they want more regional stability, you know, they need to do something to about the military. Um, so that's, that's why I would say, and, and I agree with what Chris said. Thank you. Mimi, uh, you mentioned that your epic four hours with the Indo-Pacific Dialogue. Uh, India is a country which has to be central to a lot of people thinking about what happens for Myanmar's future. How do you see India in terms of the future Myanmar debate? Right. So India, it has been, you know, quite disappointing, right? Given that they're a democracy and uh, 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 they have not been, you know, helping the pro-democracy movement. But also, again, back to communication. I think that many times, I, I just had my, one of my student, former student, they just, he just, she just came through here. She works for a, um, a think tank, a security think tank in, in India. And she said, she go, oh, Mimi, you know, she wanted to know how Myanmar was doing. I haven't heard much about it. So that's not much, you know, being uh, talked about in India about what's happening in Myanmar, right? So for India, so again, back to having the resistance side and NUG, do they really need a, a, a really a, a good stratcom strategy to make sure that their story is being told? And they're like, um, SAC is on its leg. I mean, yes, it's still doing a lot of damage, but SAC control, like SAC, yeah, SAC, SAC M reports that less than half the country, right? And that is also from anecdotal reporting that I have talked to people has the same thing. One of my friends went to Mandalay and she said that as soon as she got like a couple miles outside of Mandalay, she starts seeing PDFs uh, checkpoints, not SAC checkpoint, PDF checkpoints, right? So the so, um, you know, it, it goes back to SACM's uh, finding and my anecdotal uh, uh, understanding based on pe what people are reporting from inside. So I think that India doesn't understand that they are supporting the, you know, the military that is not, uh, that doesn't have a control of the country fully, right? And so if they know more, they will probably bet on the winning side. And that may be, that will be the one that will tip the balance a little bit more. Right now they're in a, in a you know, a, in a balance between the, uh, all the Myanmar military, the only reason Myanmar military is able to survive is because they have the firepower, right? The air power. Air power is the one that giving them a little, you know, to be able to check the, the resistance forces. Without their air power and without their uh, Russia support, I think people can take them out. Right, but to tip the balance on the people side, just a little help from the the West and like neighbors could do go a long way. Okay, thank you. That's good. Having uh, thought about India, we'll come back to the issue of China perhaps later on, but we'll we'll go around these questions a little bit more. My own personal view is that it's possible to talk about sanctions as an issue, but you can't do that without in isolation, you've got to talk about the other things that happen in the country. So if you provide sanctions, put sanctions on the military regime, you've got to do something about the assistance you give to the others. Now, in the US, Mimi, the Burma Act permits assistance to be given directly to the, if you like, to the NUG and the democracy forces. Is that right? That's correct. <laughs> The Burma Act for the very first time recognized the EAO or EROs, right? Uh, uh, ethnic armed organizations. So that's a major, a huge, a huge uh, uh, development. And uh, Burma Act uh, said uh, they can provide, uh, the US will provide non-lethal aid, non-lethal aid. So uh, that what that's the law, non lethal aid. You know, it gives a big framework. But how is that going to translate into specific action and aid uh, assistance? Uh, is right now being worked out. 
So I couldn't tell you exactly what 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 would look like, but you know, communicate. For example, communication, right? Like I was saying, both the equipment and the services, and also um, uh, some type of a technical training associated with the commu communication is a non-lethal. Uh, also, you know, maybe intelligence sharing, right? Because they need early warning for to evacuate population when the plane is coming, right? So that type of sharing information, uh, having a more um, uh, 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 accurate map so that, you know, it will make the, the, the humanitarian aid delivery much better, much more effective. That type of stuff are, um, uh, uh, I, are considered non-lethal, right? So, but what it is going to be exactly, that is something that has to be worked out. And they were saying like by, by April or so, that might have some idea because they have a task force um, form to look at that, trying to turn the, you know, the, the law into action, actual, sp more, more specific action. This then comes back, uh, Chris, to the issue of Australia's aid program. It's been a continuing disappointment to me that we've never really seemed to be able to grasp the issue of how to provide assistance to the communities in Myanmar, to the people who need money for their clinics, for their schools, for lots of community level action. We think we can satisfy our own box ticking exercise by dumping millions of dollars on UNICEF or one of those sorts of organizations, but not to the others. Do you see a link between the imposition of sanctions on individuals at the top of the regime and providing more direct assistance to the mass of the people through communities in a way yet to be devised by Australia, but already devised by some other countries. There's, there's a clear link, Chris, as I indicated. It, um, taking negative action is not sufficient. We have to take positive steps as well, and that's where the aid and development assistance comes in. Um, there are large parts of the country where um, the democratic organisations generally, so the NUG, the, the Citizens um, uh, Disobedient Movement, the, um, the, the um, ethnic organisations, they're starting to establish uh, governmental structures and administer. They're, they're running schools, they're running hospitals. I mean, they've even started to establish a court system and, and, and having courts. Uh, a very significant development for me relates to uh, international humanitarian law or the, the law of war. The NUG adopted a code of conduct for all those that are fighting the military very early in the piece. And there's been scepticism about whether it was able or willing to implement it. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a trial of a number of soldiers who had killed um, civilians and they were convicted and sentenced to a term of imprisonment. So we're starting to see um, proper civilian administration emerging. And we're starting to see the implementation of international humanitarian law and the development of other laws slowly, painstakingly slowly, but it has happened. Uh, and we have opportunities to assist that process. Um, if we just fund the military through emergency or humanitarian assistance or UN agencies, which unfortunately are only working with the military, we're not going to be reaching the areas of greatest need and we're not going to be reaching the majority of the population because the military can't get access to the majority of the population. So we should be concerned about development in, in Myanmar. We should be concerned about the fact that more and more people have been plunged into absolute poverty. And there are ways to provide assistance that to date we have not been taking. Now, one difficulty is that much of this aid needs to be provided on the ground cross border. And uh, here, the Thai authorities have not been particularly helpful. Absolutely. So we, we have a need for diplomacy as well to convince the Thai authorities that this kind of development and humanitarian assistance is essential and has to be provided. But Thailand's another good, good ally of ours. I mean, if, if our friendships with Southeast Asian countries mean anything, they should be being used at a time of regional crisis like this one, rather than standing back and saying that we're not going to right. interfere. Right. Um, the, the situation of, of India, India is an enormous country. And although, as, as Mimi says, the Indian government itself has been very close to the military, 
some of the Indian states along the Western Myanmar, Eastern India border have been extremely supportive um, of the CDM and, and particularly supportive um, of the, the citizens' movements amongst the Chin in Chin state and providing both refuge for refugees and material support for those that are trying to build alternative administrations. So if the Indian government won't be cooperative, we can deal with the Indian states that are. Um, we don't have to lock ourselves in entirely to those that are refusing to assist. I keep on forgetting to unmute myself before launching forth when you finish speaking. Uh, when you talked about banks before, I agree with what you said about banks, but the difficulty with that, and it's not resolved by what I'm going to say, is that you need to have a mechanism through which you can get money to the people inside the country. And it's, it's, as everybody here who's involved in aid program support for the communities knows, uh, there's no simple, easy way to move the money, and except perhaps across the border from a bank in Thailand or people carrying wads of cash or other things that are quite unsafe ways of doing it. Do you have any solution to that? Or Mimi, do you know of any way in which money can move more easily into the country to support communities? And then think about the schools and the clinics and all those sorts of things. Mimi. Yeah. Well, one of the way we were able to get information, you know, you can't use the banking system, right? That you have to really just take the cash in. And um, a women group, women groups that are uh, the, the like women league of burma uh, the, the, is a is a uh, is a, com a a conglomeration of about 16 women women ethnic minority women groups uh and the majority of them are in the border area so they're able to move a lot of um aid that way and they are they also they you know when i was interviewing them in december they were very frustrated that um you know, they can move the aid. They have a lot of capacity still, but the donors are not utilizing them. And then when they utilize them, they also uh, put so much um, uh, uh, red tapes to it, right? So they couldn't, it, so some of them are like, uh, 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 they have uh, uh, their new organization as the result of the, the, the coup, but because they're new organization, they have no registration. And many of the aid donor require registration. Well, if they go and register, they will get captured, you know? <laughs> and, and so there's no way. Uh, and so they were kind of frustrated as well that, that they, they think they can move a lot of the aid, but they're not being utilized to the capacity. And a lot of the red tapes are also, you know, uh, uh, preventing them from being able to do it. Thank you, Mimi. On that last point, before going back to Chris, I should say that what I've been trying to do here is to get people to understand in the Australian government that when they want accountability for an aid contribution, they can't get in present Myanmar accountability through a government or a military organisation. It's just impossible to think of that. So my question then back to people in the NUG is, why don't you have a system which allows for the registration of non-government organizations in a form that would meet the audit requirements of a body like the Australian government. And they look at me, all of them look at me quite blankly, but I want to stay on that case. I think there is, there is stuff that we should be able to do to help build the capacity of the NUG to deliver that form of accountability mechanism, because it's going to be more and more necessary all the time. And, and in particular, if you were to go to the step envisaged by the Burma Act and provide direct support to the, to the NUG, the CDM, the whatever, the EROs, there's got to be some form of registration for them as well. It's unavoidable in the modern world, unfortunately. But do you have any comment on that, uh, Mimi or Chris, about what the NUG is doing to try to register a non-government framework? Um, what they're doing, Chris, is not much. And I, I would extend your comment beyond just the NGO registration. The, the NUG ministers are absolutely overwhelmed. They're, they're swamped. And there's a, a lot of things that haven't occurred, including most particularly lawmaking. Um, to take, I think, an even more urgent example about the Rohingya and citizenship 
the NUG committed themselves in July 2021 to getting rid of the Citizenship Act, replacing it with the Modern Citizenship Act that incorporates or includes the Rohingya in concepts of citizenship. But it's not been able to, to draft that legislation. Um, if we're talking about providing assistance to the democratic movement, amongst the assistance that's needed is legislative drafting assistance. So that, that the necessary laws can, that, that, that can't wait. I mean, it's, it's got to the stage now, two years after the coup began, that, that these laws can't wait for the reasons that you describe in relation to NGOs and that I've referred to in relation to citizenship. So that kind of support is needed, but it's not being provided that I can see by any of the governments that are expressing their opposition to the military and their support for democracy. That's right. You end up with what looks like a rather cheap expression of sanctions on 16 people and two companies, and then people saying, job done, let's move on. Right. With the Rohingya issue, you know, I think that Bangladesh is missing an opportunity here because this is the time Bangladesh can probably negotiate the return of Rohingya, and Rohingya will not return unless they get citizenship, right? That's one of the thing with the NUG uh, uh, and the resistance for resistance side, and you know, in return, recognizing NUG and helping NUG, right? Because they do share border. There are certain things like delivery you can get through uh, uh, Bangladesh if they wanted to play, but Bangladesh hasn't come, uh, has not played at all in this particular. And I think that they have a, they can use the, you know, their assistant as a leverage to, you know, negotiate for on behalf of the, the Rohingya in this particular time. Right. Um, going back to ASEAN just for a moment. It interests me also to think about the Asian quad where you have Australia, India, Japan, and the United States in a meeting together. One would think that that was a, a grouping that could do something useful uh, about cooperation towards democracy assistance in Myanmar. Have you seen any, any sign of that, Mimi? No, I haven't seen that, but that would be the, you know, the, the, uh, the grouping or uh, the platform that other country can use for India to towards India to have that um, you know the, change their policy to be more um, uh, helpful to the the democracy side rather than than the SAC yeah but I have not seen it I haven't heard what about you Chris have you heard anything of the use of the quad no, no I haven't you know it's it, it strikes me as being yet another mechanism that is missing this opportunity. Yeah. You know, I, I've referred to us, you know, and the ASEAN Regional Forum, which brings in the others. The Quad doesn't seem to be being used. Um, I'm not. A, I haven't heard any rumours of discussions in the AUKUS context. You know, we have all of these um, flamboyant new talking spots, but um, this is a serious regional security crisis, and um, it seems that no one wants to know about it. Yeah. Now, I want to turn to people in the, in the Myanmar diaspora. Tintanu, you're here still? Well, Tintanu, are you there? She posed a question earlier on. Oh, okay. Is she there? No. It's about the overseas Burmese willing to pour their savings in to help get rid of the military. I'm here. Tintanu, you're there. Yeah. See, your question, yeah. Tintanu, that's what I'm referring to. And yeah, thank I want to you. ask you to elaborate, elaborate a little bit more. What do you um, think that the diaspora population can do to bring more advice to the Australian government on what they should do with these sanctions? Uh, we just have to be together to be able to, you know, go and talk to the to the government if possible. If uh, the Australian, like you, can you know organize for us? We are quite willing to go and talk. I used to go and talk for when when uh, Alexander Downer was there in eighty eight students, but uh, nothing happened there. 
but a few students come here to, to Australia, that's all. Uh, right now, what we are doing is helping at the uh, you know, grassroots level is we just been sending money. Just, just yesterday, I've sent money to build a library in Bagot Division, uh, organized by the CDM students who are my former students in, in Rangoon. So th that's what we've been doing, uh, helping uh, you know, mother and baby conditions and helping all the things that the Burmese diaspora have been doing. We are doing it by ourselves. And I heard that if we got one million, we can, we can have a good armament system that, uh, you know, we, we have this aspiration to be able to help the, the Burmese uh, young PDF. I have some young doctors who I have educated from the villages who are still running around, around doing things. And I, I, that's what I feel we should all help them in. Yeah, of course, there are some Burmese who are quite uh, aloof about it, but still there are a lot of people like, um, my, myself, who has strong, strong, you know, um, uh, minds to help our country. Yeah, the, what yeah. we need is advocacy for us, and we can group and you know, go and have a talk if need be. We're trying to get, promote ourselves in any way we can. Uh, I've I've just been uh, uh, helping the refugees from. Uh, Ukraine and uh, Sri Lanka, but I wish I can help more of my Burmese refugees, which which uh, I've been promoting in our local government level. What have you done at the local government level? Uh, I I don't want to brag, but I just I just got a, a senior citizenship award. <laughs> <laughs> but what but, but uh, in, on that day I said to our you know local councillors and our state uh, you know, member uh, and also federal member, please help our refugees. We still have 12,000 people yeah, waiting. Well, and you live in, in the, on the north coast, is that or the central coast of New South Wales, is that right? Sorry, yeah, I'm still, I'm still in, uh, sorry, sometimes I didn't hear. Yeah, I'm still in New South Wales, uh, near Port Macquarie, northern New South Wales, uh, or mid, mid, uh, mid, mid, mid North Coast, to be exact. Which federal electorate is that? This is, uh, I don't want to make this tiresome. Line. The other line. line. Yeah. I, I want to say at this point that we have had contact with people in different parts of the rural New South Wales but along that coast. Yeah. who are making representations to their members of parliament, yeah. all of whom come from the, the current opposition, the National Party. Yeah, and that, they do. That has led yeah. to the, uh, us learning about the new membership of the Parliamentary Friends of Myanmar, which has got most of these people in it, in the Friends Group. None of them yeah. were there before yeah. in the life of the last parliament. But okay. they've been stimulated somehow by what you're saying. And I think that part of the answer to the questions that are being put tonight, including by you, Chris Sidoti, is that the members of parliament have to become more engaged with this. And what I we have, have said, including in, in the letter that we sent to Foreign Minister Wong about the sanctions, welcoming them and then adding to that, we would like to see some sort of parliamentary process under which the government has to report to the parliament about what the sanctions are designed to do and what they've achieved. Put a little bit of microscope onto those sorts of processes and create some public debate. Because the other problem that we all have is that the media attention to this is terrible. It's 10 minutes of sunshine after the announcement and that's it. Then they move back onto something else. Mimi, the, the, the US media has been better than the Australian media at looking at the situation in Myanmar. That's not saying much, <laughs> but I think it's been, there's been stronger attention in the US than in Australia. And I'd like right. to try and work out why somehow. Right. Well, that's but going back to, you know, that the communication, right? Strategic communication strategy. Uh, you know, uh, I think that the, the, we should look at the uh, Zelensky and his team. They have a whole battalion of communication, you know, communication battalion, trying to get, make sure their messages are out. And NUG doesn't have that, right? So if you want that, you know, yes, that the international community is not paying attention, but also it has to do with 
you you know the 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 NUG and the the, the resistant ability to tell the story. You know, they have to be able to have a coherent story, coherent and consistent, you know, messages that are coming out that will resonate with the target audiences, right? So, um, you know, to the degree that they don't have it or they don't focus on it, they don't prioritize it, then you're not going to get the effect that you want, right? <laughs> so it's, yes, they're not paying attention, but also it's it's the, the result of your an inability to tell the story or focus on that. So that's why in this assistance world, you know, uh, the communication, helping them with public relations, strategic communication, how do you formulate, you know, those things will be very, very helpful for them. I remember hearing that, uh, I think it was in the time of, uh, I think it was in the time of Nay Win, but it might've been later. It might've been when Tan Shui was in his earlier days. The, the military spent a lot of money on a public relations firm in Washington to help mm. to get them to design the message. So don't you Burmese, don't you work out the message. We know what you need to say and we know who you need to say it to. And this is the way it's done. They packaged it and they followed it and they got quite well uh, results from it. But the appearance now is that no, nobody knows who's doing what or why. That applies to the Myanmar regime as well, to the military. It's a hopeless public relations effort, but that's a, a big pity. Yeah. Anyway, we are at the end of our time, I'm sorry to say. Is there anything you'd like to say, Mimi, to round out the discussion? Um, yes, uh, the, you know, saying like, uh, since our, our theme of today is sanction and, and sanctions are important, you know, but beyond, we do need a little bit more than sanction. And, and you know, just to tell you, my 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 sources are telling me that, uh, you know, the elder son of General Yabye is living and, you know, working in Australia. So uh, I don't know how he get around the sanctions or whatever, but, uh, you know, uh, taking more closer look to making sure that the sanctions are being uh, enforced. And, and, and I understand the sanction of, uh, you know, the Burmese names are kind of crazy. You know, there's so many sim similar names. So getting the right person sanctioned is, is difficult. But nevertheless, though, this is uh, my sources are telling me that. So, um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for, you know, uh, caring for the people of Myanmar and, you know, the, the uh, events like this is a part of the communication, trying to tell the Myanmar story is really, really important. And thank you. Well, Mimi. thank you, Mimi. And we will bring you back here, if you don't mind, this was not the not the end of your association with sure. AMI. <laughs> That'll be good. Thank, Chris, you, do you, want to, thank you. Do you have any rounding outs to say, Chris? Uh, only to reiterate, Chris, what I said earlier, we, we've only just started in this country in responding to what's happened in Myanmar. <laughs> And we've got a long way to go. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people in, in foreign affairs. They're, they're very clever and they're very committed. So where's the creativity? I mean, where are the ideas? Where's the, the serious discussions about what needs to be done in response to the Myanmar situation? Um, this is on our doorstep. Uh, it, it's not on the other side of the world. And we've got a far greater responsibility to address the situation in, than we have to address the situation in Ukraine without minimising the seriousness of what is happening there. Myanmar's on our doorstep. So the kinds of actions we've discussed tonight, the, the, the local initiatives with MPs, with, with media, um, anything that can keep these issues alive, um, these kinds of actions are extremely important. And, and let's start demanding of government and foreign affairs, um, a little bit of intelligent creativity to go alongside the fine rhetoric. I agree very heavily with that, very strongly. And as for the Australian government, the other thing I should say that I detect is that it's all very well for foreign affairs, the foreign minister to announce sanctions. What doesn't seem to have happened has been any message going out from foreign affairs to other government departments about what that means in terms of the country. And there are some indications here and there now that the visa people in the immigration department 
don't understand what this means and thinks that Myanmar is a place from which nobody should come with a valid visa in case they never go back because the sanctions prove that things are very dangerous. Well, there's work to be done. But thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who was here with us all tonight, and we'll see you in, in a month, and we will have another of these excellent seminars. Thank you. Thank you.